Hi, and welcome back to the Brando and Joe podcast. For this podcast episode, our guest is Zachary Markovsky. He received his master's in IO psychology from Toro University, currently works as a senior specialist data governance for Talent Neuron, and has previous experience as a data analyst. Welcome, Zachary. Hi, thanks, thanks for bringing me on. It's great talking to you guys. Yeah, we're excited for this one. I'm excited to hear all about your uh, your data background. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hearing all that, that's um, a lot different than some of the intros that we've had in the past. So it's kind of cool uh, to hear that. But so getting started, uh, we're talking a little bit about the work you're doing with data and all of that. But before we get into that, you do have a degree in I.O., but it sounds like your career is a little bit different. So can you kind of paint a picture of what your career looks like for our listeners out there? Sure. Uh, yeah. So pretty much I have my degree in IO. It's the base that I work off of, but most of my work has actually been far less in the traditional IO doing assessments, uh, do it, being like an HR person, a lot more in the data field. I started in HR work, uh, probably one of my first like roles that I really did seriously was being an HR analyst at being an uh, HR analyst at the MTA in New York City. Uh, but when I was there, it was the actual HR work was a little bit painful for me, um, especially within a government organization, everything like that. But myself and my friend Jacob got a project at one point uh, to try to figure out how to solve a issue we were having where everything was very manually done and trying to figure out how to turn it into a more technological database way. And so he and I basically for about a month or two built an entire database at the time in Microsoft Access, not really knowing much tech work, but it gave me this drive to try to solve more business problems with data. And as I went along, I worked uh, I worked in startups, trying to run one at one point with a friend. Then I worked in behavioral science consulting. But around the pandemic, uh, I lost that job due to the various issues around the pandemic. And I had to sit there and really think of, to myself, what do I want to do with my life? Here in Montreal, it's a little bit different than in, than in New York City, where I went to grad school. Um, the opportunities are different. The type of work you do is different. So I had to really think about it. And the thing that drove me to the data field was the work I did before. And a lot of the IOs that I met along the way who were very, very data heavy. Uh, two of the people who, ins uh, three of the people who inspired me the most were Sai Islam and Mike Chetta uh, from, Talent from Talent Metrics. I'm currently wearing their shirt. Um, we love Dr. Islam. <laughs> we love him. Oh, yeah. I know. And you got to get, and you got to get Mike on as well. Um, he's great. Uh, he was my he was my advisor for my internship program at Turo, um, and so that's how I know them. Um, but yeah, their work inspired me a lot. My friend uh, Josh Elmore, uh, he, a lot of his work inspired me too, and it made me say, okay, I'm going to actually take doing data seriously. And for why, for during the pandemic, I started to self teach myself, and then eventually I said, okay, I need to get to a far higher proficiency that I'm going to be able to get on my own. So I went back to my undergraduate alma mater uh, and did a certification in data science and machine learning at McGill University. And from there, I started working more directly in the data field, first as a data analyst. And now I work in data governance at Talent Neuron, which is a talent intelligence company. And I'm basically the person making sure it's all valid, all of our data is valid at a high quality and useful for IOs like myself. So yeah, that's a little synopsis of what I've done so far. My uh, my initial question was, did you get free tickets when working for the MTI? That's like the bulk <laughs> yes, of my spent right now. Yes, <laughs> actually you do. So, so the ID that you use as your ID for work is a card. It's an actual Metro card. Yeah, so oh, like, oh, wow. so one that's good because you know you always have it on you it's free two that also means you have to have your work id on you during off hours and it's always terrifying to potentially lose it because that's not fun so in I, there are definitely there are demotion uh like there are issues if you do lose it so yeah that was always a blessing and a curse a little bit I want, maybe they're, uh, we'll see if they're hiring. I, mean, I could use that. Uh, yeah, look at their uh, <laughs> test assessment group if you want, if you want something there. <laughs> um, 
But my follow-up question was, uh, it sounds like you have a super interesting background, um, but the title you hold now, Data yep. Governance, mm-hmm. it's not something that I've ever heard before. Is it somewhat like a data analyst or is it a different position entirely or like what kind of work do you actually do? Well, data governance as a field is very different depending on what type of organization you're at. Typically, when you hear about data governance and you think about it, you're mostly going to see it in banks. The reason why is be- the reason why is because the regulation around data in a bank is extremely tight and extremely stringent. So for them, governance work is far more about compliance, about making sure that the work that the data that you're producing is catalog understood and valid not just because you want to make a good product, but because if you don't, you will be sued into the ground. However, outside of banks, governance can be a lot of things. At my organization, governance is kind of a mix between uh, being a data scientist, being a data analyst, being and being just a domain expert. A lot of our work is basically looking at the methodologies that are developed by our data, various data scientists and seeing if they're actually up to the standards we want and producing the type of data we need. For myself as an IO, the thing that drove me to go for this position when, it, when I was recruited for it was because of one, it, the domain is talent intelligence. Um, if you haven't read the article by Richard Rosenau on the difference between people analytics and talent intelligence. I recommend it and I recommend it for audience to see that field because it's a little bit different. Talent intelligence is essentially much more about the external part of work and external part of the labor market. It tells you about job postings, about um, supply, a lot of more labor economics. So it drove me to that because it was a related field. And the second is because it's far more about taking the scientific work that we do and we understand and using it to check the work that is typically done by data scientists and software engineers and making sure that they're actually doing things up to a high standard of validity. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. That's I make really it cool. sound really cool, but most of uh, so much of my day is reading and reading documentation and telling people if they're doing their job right or not it's, so, it's kind of fun yeah <laughs> but but like here's an example though of why i think the work i do and i think data work in general can really be useful for ios i was just reading some documentation we had on a previous analysis done by someone at my organization and there was a lot of things there that were missing from how we would look at a problem, try to understand it and solve it and, and have some kind of consistency across the way we keep things val- validated. They miss some important statistical metrics, things like that. And we're going to be redoing this analysis very shortly. But it's one of those things that I find that IO, more than other social science disciplines, has the ability to merge into the data field, not just from an HR perspective, but just data in general, for the fact that we're both a mix of a high business acumen field, plus one that takes a rigorous scientific approach to everything, and especially that the type of problems we solve are not typical. They're not, um, they're not things like natural sciences where it's very clear cut the thing you're working on they're ambiguous the variables are mostly are a lot of time unknown and we're used to the accuracy of our predictions not being a hundred percent and figure it working with that ambiguity that makes sense for sure joe and i have talked about that we were we were looking at um maybe some data storytelling certificates i know i had Mm. a friend who went and got one of those and then we talked with some professors and talked with, amongst our cohort and everyone was basically like, if we get our master's degree, that basically is like the same thing <laughs> because well, our IO degree sets us up for that. Yeah. Storytelling is one of those things I don't think is necessary for a certification um, because storytelling is storytelling. Yeah, maybe it'll teach you a little bit more about the technology you're using for storytelling, but I do agree. I, if your IO program made you do a lot of presentation. Um, do a lot of explaining research, do a lot of explaining ideas 
and doing it well to an audience, then that's basically the, the underlying principles of data storytelling. Um, however, the, a lot of the other parts of the data field that are not about just making a presentation are the things that IO programs lack a lot of the time. Um, they're getting better. Uh, I heard that, uh, I, I know that you guys have um, like at least one seminar on like people analytics or something like that. And um, there's a lot of programs that are teaching more R and more and more use of programming within the work, but there's a lot, a lot of things within the data field itself, within machine learning, within statistical learning that is not taught in IO because it's not IO, but it's a field that can work very well together. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that like the field of IO, while it may not be like a hundred percent data, it can kind of build that bridge between making those presentations and doing that that storytelling, which we basically described as just kind of like presenting the information in a way that's digestible and not just handing them an Excel spreadsheet and saying like, look what I found. They're like, oh, what, yeah. what is this? <laughs> Absolutely. Any IO has to be able to translate data. That's the whole reason you're there is to be able to translate this science that is ineffable to a business uh, to a business subject matter expert into something useful. And, uh, but the question that I have for you is um, your certificate mm. was there, was it basically learning that soft, those softwares or those languages, or did it kind of do that part of, you know, showing you how to explain the data using those softwares and then like presenting it? Um, there was a little bit of that uh, presentation explanation, but it didn't focus on teaching those data storytelling. There is one other certification by McGill that's more focused on that, but I took the one that's more technical. Uh, it was far more teaching you tech, like hard technical skills. Uh, it, I already knew some Python, but it went far more in depth on it. Uh, it taught me statistical learning, which is a field of statistics, specifically that uh, focusing on teaching, on creating a statistical models that allow themselves to update, to learn, and to make prediction. Um, it also taught me well, just how to really be a data scientist. It taught me the. It taught me how to create models. It taught me how to run on distributed computing systems. It taught me how to solve an actual data science problem from end to end. And while the scientific method that I knew as my bread and butter from I/O made it really easy to understand how to do those problems, the actual techniques to execute them along the way are the things I didn't know until doing this course, until doing this program. And that's the really the thing that that i got value out of it because before that i was a scientist but not a data scientist now i'm both that, yeah i mean we we got to talk about this a little before we started recording uh, but i would love for you to explain mm -hmm. to our audience a little bit more in depth of what that field of statistics is like and oh. what and what that kind of looks like for you well and what you um going deep into the field of statistical learning is probably not something i specifically want to do i Essentially, when you hear a thing, I will say for your audience, if you hear words like uh, linear regression, logistic regression, um, um, uh, support vector machine, random forest, uh, decision tree, anything like that, like anything that's like those machine learning models of the traditional ones, before you hear things about deep learning, that's statistical learning. Uh, and th that is basically what it is. And we learn a lot about things like innovas. We learn about experimental design. We learn about um, we learn about regression, but we don't really go much in depth unless you're a PhD who's specifically targeting a a specific thing about all of those other types of ways we can do uh, we can do predictive modeling, and that's essentially what statistical learning is. It's it's the statistics of predictive modeling. Um, yeah, it, I'll, I'll say my program was though, it, like allowed us to learn that, but also a lot of the actual practical way to apply it with programming, specifically Python. You're definitely right with like in our program, at least we learned those words. It seems like maybe we learned it more in an academic sense as well. Uh, but 
I guess do you see the field of IO or maybe just like the programs and master's programs of IO going more to that data side. Cause right now we have, you know, not that consulting doesn't have to do with data. I know there's, you mm-hmm. use data a lot in consulting, um, but whether you're doing like org development or consulting um, and these roles versus like a purely data analyst role, yeah. I'm wondering, we've actually had a lot of people that work with data on like our previous episodes yeah. are like, are we just okay. turning into like a people analytics podcast? Um, <laughs> but, I, so, but I guess my question is, is like, do you see the, the field of IO going into more just like mm. data psychology? I I think when you like when you point out like are we becoming a people analytics podcast i think that's so just because a lot of the current zeitgeist around data is affecting io the same way it's affecting every single field um so for us uh, we are being pushed more and more into doing that and it's not a problem i think obviously as someone who works in data and has devoted their career trajectory to that that data is incredibly good and it's a great thing to do, but it's not everything we do. Half of the stuff I, like a lot of the work I do is just as much my qualitative part of my my training as much as my quantitative. Um, Yes, we, yes, IO grad degrees probably are gonna be pushed a little bit more into doing that. It's gonna be slow because academia is slow. Um, and people are going to get pushed more into that, of that feeling like, oh, maybe I should go into that field. Oh, that's the hot field. I should do that. But not, first off, not everyone's a programmer. Um, not everyone, even, not everyone who's a psychologist thinks in numbers as the way of doing things and they shouldn't, it's not the only way to do things. And it's not always the best way to do things. There's plenty of times, like both of you. Uh, you guys talked about consulting, like consulting isn't just about taking numbers and giving them an answer. It's about executing a strategy. It's about figuring out the best thing for an organization. And a lot of that is not something that's necessarily numeric, like culture, the culture of an organization and how you apply some solution to it is not usually a numerically uh, understandable factor. A lot of the time it's sitting down with leaders, understanding them, understanding the people who work there, figuring out how to tailor something to a business need. And it, that's a th- another reason I like being an IO and a data scientist is because I'm not just looking at things like from numbers. I can look at it from both angles and it can tell me when a nut, when the mathematics is the best way to solve something and when the human side is the best way to solve something. So for me, uh, for me, IO should have more data in it. People should come out of grad school with at least the ability to understand data, but they shouldn't all, but it shouldn't turn out data scientists. That's not the point of what we do. Yeah. Like Zachary, you mentioned there about how education is going to move probably a little bit slower. So for you personally, uh, you talk about this certification you did, mm-hmm. and it seems like you got tremendous value out of it. Yeah. Um, for us talking to students who are trying to get into IO, um, what are your opinions on them going out and like looking at some of these certifications as ways to like help boost their knowledge? I will say, find out what you want to do before diving into anything else, especially in the U.S. Because like I live in Canada, um, do you want to know how much? Uh, university is here in montreal uh, <laughs> probably, probably probably less expensive than what i pay <laughs> I, for undergrad for undergrad i paid three thousand a year yeah, yeah. that's terrible i know that's, i I'm paid sad. more i paid more for my grad degree in new york than i paid for my entire undergrad and i took five years because i changed from microbiology to psychology <laughs> The, and my whole certification program, I think, if I paid full price, was six, was six thousand. But I had, but there are some things to reduce the cost for things. So this thing, certifications, all these things, all these additional education, they're one expensive and two they're time sinks. When you make a decision like that to increase your education it has to be just as deliberate as going to grad school just as deliberate as choosing a job to begin with deliberate as any big decision 
And you, people should not try to chase going into data or chase a certification, but first really know if they want to do this, if they want to take a plunge and learn something before they do that. And there's a lot of things you, you can do without ever having to pay for anything. There's plenty of free resources. A lot of them are extremely good. And a lot of them are very, very structured too, uh, especially in the, in pure coding, there's a lot of completely free resources that are almost as structured as going and getting a certification. However, however, not everyone has that ability. Why did I, like the reason I went to get my certification isn't just because I wanted to have experts teach me, but because I'm neurodivergent, I have ADHD. It's not easy for me to just go and force myself to sit at a computer a few hours a day and just learn something on my own without something pushing me. I've been trying to do, I try to do that stuff for projects all the time and it's very slow going. So, so certifications are something you need to take very seriously when you decide them. And sometimes they're going to be the best option for you. And sometimes they're going to be a waste of a lot of time and money. I think you bring up a very good point about like knowing what you want to do as well. We're not like the first people to realize that data and programming and coding is becoming, a, and not that it's become, it's already a large field. There's bound to be certifications and courses out there that are going to make you pay that are really not going to do what you want mm -hmm. them to do. Yeah. So doing your research and like you said, using those free resources I think one of them is literally called like free code. Camp. Free code. Like camp. It has the word that, free. Yeah. Yeah. Free co <laughs> Freecodecamp.com. That's both a YouTube channel and website. And it's really, really good. However, it is also just like a straight up, uh, YouTube channel, like watch a video, apply things, which is great. But once again, not everyone can learn from just those kind of big open courses, even free ones. Yeah. Like, I, I don't remember the games. Yeah. Like I forget the percentage of it, but there's a, it's an extremely high percentage of dropout rates for those uh, like gigantic open online courses. Um, so people will pay, people either use free ones or they'll pay for very cheap ones and try to do them and then not be able to do it. So. Yeah, it's definitely, you got to see what works for you. I think it's a good idea when you get started, even if it's like for a week, you're just like, what is Python? And you know, and you, you know, you learn the basics of Python or not even learn, just kind of get an idea. Yeah. And then you can maybe see a certificate um, or like not, eight courses that are structured. Not even that. You know. Go, you have to go a lot further. You need to, before you go and pay for a certification, you should be able to make something with code without paying anyone like make and make a small application do some analysis be able to do the basics because the thing you're paying people for is like expert level knowledge like going from beginner beginner to intermediate to advanced that's what you're paying people for if you're paying any like that's the one thing i will agree with people if you pay anyone to learn the basics of it that payment better be less than 20 dollars. because if you're paying more than that you're getting scammed so you're talking about like you're paying for a course that's going to teach you that high level knowledge that would be yeah. difficult to obtain by yourself. And you kind of get that mentor. Yeah, uh, it's, it's also it's also just like, you know, the same way how on the master's program makes you do like, you know, capstone projects or it makes you do like consulting work or it makes you do projects with people and it forces you to do something that is a simulation of the real world that's the same reason you go to a certification program like a good one because it also it also forces you to do something that you're not just going to throw yourself into it's like people learn a lot of work on the job but very rarely did they just go onto the job site and say oh i'm gonna do this today no there's usually some goal some work some project given to you by a higher up and then you do it and you learn, and you get better. And eventually, once you're expert, then you're the person saying, hey, maybe I should make this study. Oh, maybe we should launch this product or maybe I should run this company. But, you, but it takes a long time to get there. And when you're beginning, you need someone to pull you up there.
one like other thing that I forgot to mention about uh, how I was feeling at PSYOP this year is because my last PSYOP before this previous one was Washington, which was radically different. Uh, most of the difference was that this one was extremely dominated by people in analytics. You really couldn't avoid hearing people talk about AI and ethics and use of AI and NLP and data science and yada, 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 which for me as a data person was great, but it also made me feel really weird because it felt like that was all people were talking about. And IO is far more than just data science and the application of it. And it's great. I like the fact that we're using a lot of the, more of these because they allow a lot of the work that we do to function at, at scales that we aren't used to, allow it to be faster, be better, be more valid in, in new avenues. But like, there's a lot more to the field than data. And like, yeah, I can go listen to data all the time, but like, I come to PSYOP because I love IO psychology, not because I love data science. And, you know, I want to hear more about like, you know, what's the latest in leadership research and motivation and how are we making change management better? And how is selection, uh, how is selection improving and changing uh, in changing in ways that aren't just the use of AI and selection? How are, you know, all, all these things are the things I I don't know, I, I became an IO4 and yeah, I love to hear how people are using data to do these things better, but, but hopefully next year, it's not just 90%, 90% people analytics presentations. And then like one person talking, one person in a room talking about, oh, well, yeah, we're still doing some, uh, we're still doing some diversity and inclusion research. Everyone seems to have forgotten about us, even though we're extremely fundamentally important to the fabric of society, but eh, it's too bad. <laughs> well, you're, you're right. Cause we, we, we talk about, especially on this podcast, this episode, uh, the idea that IO, you could do so many different things. Yeah. And now, even though we love talking about data, we don't want to, you know, pigeonhole ourselves and just becoming, like we said yeah. before, data analysts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially because like the, the thing is like, we'll, we'll win on domain expertise. Like a lot of companies, a lot of companies like don't already don't really know what we are. Uh, so if we're trying to compete solely on like how good we can be as data scientists, we're going to lose. Um, if we focus completely on that, then if we focus completely on that and we just apply everything through that lens, you're eventually someone's going to come up with some model that is so good in some way and beat you out, even though they're going to forget a bunch of very important variables underlying. Like, for example, uh, Richard Lander's paper, uh, uh, paper showing the simulation uh, um, basically simulation of selection, um, indicating, basically indicating like the, how ML works in comparison to the pre, the ordinary least squares methods that we usually use. Like it shows not just that, you know, ML doesn't necessarily be, become more predictive if you're considering the exact same, um, like the exact same situation we usually use as IO, but the thing that really stuck with me when reading that was that the, as the models became more complex and the ways they were applied became more sophisticated, the adverse impacts tended to go up. Which, t and the thing is, the traditional way you evaluate a machine learning model is through a type of validation that's far more about how predictive it is versus how uh, versus how predictive it is to an IO, which is more about its criterion and construct validity. But that's the thing. If you if we as IOs like let the moat happen where we basically try to compete on the same level as data scientists, we're gonna lose in the technical aspect, but then the world is going to lose on the fact that domain has been lost to an extent. And uh, and things like, and problems that we keep 
bringing up like adverse impact issues that we have with uh, biased AI that is constantly discussed, they're only going to get worse without anyone being able to really tell why. And that's because the and that's because the issues of ethics and the issues of uh, of adverse impact are kind of left at the door in favor of accuracy, speed, and that typical very um, tech tech focused move fast and break things approach to software development. Yeah, definitely. And you know we're we're running out of time. I feel like we could talk about this stuff for yeah, forever. Yeah, probably. Um, but um, we want to make sure we get our last question in with you that we ask all of our guests. So sure. um, Zachary, when we we wanted to ask you personally, what is your one piece of advice that you do have for those incoming IO students? Okay. If I'm going to give people one piece of advice, it's probably going to be don't compare yourself to others. Don't feel FOMO for not becoming some data scientist, not becoming some kind of principal consultant at, um, at like McKinsey, not becoming this very, sp or not becoming like, you know, this, uh, someone like, you know, when you look at people like, um, like Alexis Fink or, or Cole, <laughs> or like Cole, like these big, like VP level, like, like best in the field, or best in the field IOs, careers don't just do that you don't have to become you don't have to become some kind of uh some kind of rock star that knows like th two programming languages can do an organizational network analysis in their sleep also can like sell products like anything you're you're just starting and you're going to find your place and you should really explore when you start don't don't try to pressure yourself down the field, learn everything you can, feel for it, do some work. And then later down the line, after you've been out of grad school for a few years, then you can really lock in and be like, I'm going to hyper-focus into something. I'm going to go get a PhD. I'm going to, I'm going to go start a company. I'm going to do whatever I want because I'm an IO and that means I can do a lot of things. It's great advice. We've we've heard before that people say you're not locked into one specific position or job title. There's a lot of things you could do with this degree. And you brought up a good point that, you know, you, you got some time after your master's degree to try out this job and this job and then hyper focus, you know, after you have some experience into something that, you know, you probably really like. Yeah. Like there's one thing I like to say to compare to explain IO to people is that IO is to HR, like uh, accountant is to an economist, basically. Like, well, an uh, economist is to an accountant. While, while accounting and HR are both very important, they're also very much about the daily grind of, the organ of an organization. They're about keeping the wheels turning. And it can sometimes feel as an IO that you have to participate in that side of things, that you have to be part of an HR or part, or you have to do work, or you have to do very specific, you know, that traditional very I work of just uh, making sure the gears are turning. But how many economists just go and start being accountants? Not many. Uh, so why do you as an IO need to restrict yourself to this incredibly narrow box of HR? You can go be a data scientist. You can go do corporate strategy. You can run HR or you can run anything because you are an expert in organizations and people. You're not an expert in policies or procedures. You have a lot going on and you can find your, your place there. Definitely. That is great advice. And I think our, our listeners are definitely going to listen to that because I know it's really hard. Joe and I talk about this sometimes like that imposter syndrome kicks in too. And yeah, you're, yeah. you're out there and you're working <laughs> and you're, you're doing so much, but you still feel like you're not doing enough, especially when you look at all these other people. So it's nice to like kind of keep your head and you can see those yeah. people and see what they're doing and try and learn from them, but not use it as something to like compare yourself against. Yeah. Use it more as like fuel to the fire. Yeah. And, and, and the like thing is, you do stuff. Yeah, and the thing is that feeling never really goes away. 
like you're always going to feel that like you could be out of grad school and now you're working and you're like oh the senior people know a lot more than me or oh you're gonna listen to you know some of the other people who've been on your podcast and say oh those people are doing fantastic what but i can't do that uh well one of the reasons i always think about maybe i should go get a phd is i look at some of the other phds and io i'm like oh their skill in research and their knowledge and their ability and the way they talk about different research papers makes me jealous of the fact that i don't have that same that same level in those aspects but i have a lot of other things and i'm doing very well for myself and i'm in a good place and i'm continuously learning and if i just let myself get dragged down by comparing myself to others then i'm never going to be able to do anything for myself absolutely yeah sometimes looking up is like you could, it could be daunting you, you know you've had, ride that fine line between giving yourself a challenge and wanting to improve versus you know just down in the dumps because like i'll never be good <laughs> but uh hopefully you got to make sure you can uh realign yourself and, and like and like just looking at you two like for everyone who is listening who is a student um these two are just students too and they're running a podcast that they are asking a bunch of people and you guys are just starting and you're doing all this insane work but the thing is it's not like you are experts in the field who who have to have their voices known and like you're just like these super connected people who are like can get anywhere no you're just dudes and everyone listening you're the same way like we're all the same but we're all the same here and it's just about it's just about going for it and suddenly things work, start to work it and it's not about and it's not about some everything being perfect when you start. It's just about starting. Exactly. I'll let you in on a on a secret. <laughs> I feel like ninety percent of the time I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, don't worry, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. I don't either. I, I especially especially as like an IO working in like a a field where I have to explain myself to everyone I meet because they don't know what IOs are. I never feel like I know what I'm doing, and yet people still keep telling me I'm doing a good job, and I'm just like, all right, whatever you say. <laughs> that's what that's what we need. That's all we need. Oh God. <laughs> well, we can sit here and tell you you're doing a great job too. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make sure, I'll make sure to add that to my next performance review that you guys that you guys agree is doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, Zachary, this was so great. It was awesome to hear about your career and everything that you've done well, and you all the different ways you've utilized your IO um, degree. So we just want to thank you so much for your time today, Zachary. Thank you. You're very welcome, man. Yeah, thanks for joining us. All right. Take care. Yeah, you do. Well, thank you, everybody, if you made it to the end of the episode. That was a, it was a really cool one with Zachary, especially if you're into data analyst or data governance. Now we know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I didn't even know what it was before. I don't think you did either, right, Brandon? No, I, I didn't. And honestly, like, I know we, we haven't usually done an episode this long, but I thought that was like not a second wasted. I feel like there was just so much valuable information in there for students to listen to and figure out what they want to do. Yeah, absolutely. If you're interested in, you know, people analytics are like the, even like data scientists, we haven't really covered data, like pure data scientists yet. Um, but make sure to give us a listen, reach out to Zachary uh, and hope you like the episode. Yeah. See you guys next week. See you everybody.